SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. So our speaker today is audiologist Glenn Ho, who's speaking on the effects of healing, hearing loss. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ho. Hello, how are you all? Everyone good? Everyone full of lunch and everything? Not gonna fall asleep or anything like that? Good, good. Well, I guess you'll find out. So today's lecture, today's talk, which I'm very grateful to SACPA, um, in fact, for letting me hear, very grateful for a rather large and crowd that has shown up. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss something that's super important, it's very contemporary, and it affects all of us in some way or another, whether ourselves or it affects those that we, somebody that we might know. So a little bit about myself before I get into what I'm here to talk about. I'm originally from Swansea in South Wales. That's where this is not a thick Southern Alberta accent that you're hearing. Um, I'm the clinical director and owner of Audiology First. It's a local clinic. Um, I have got two degrees in audiology, one from Bristol in the UK and one from Salis in Pennsylvania. I'm working on my doctorate at the moment. Um, Fellowships in cochlear implants, hearing aids. Uh, I got my got my finger in just about every pie there is in in audiology at the moment. Um, tinnitus, hyperacusis are things that I've done research with the University of Lethbridge um, on as well. So we're published there. So um, I hope that, uh, that that can add to some credibility for what I'm about to say. Um, so the big question that I want to kind of figure out, and maybe this is a question you haven't had in your own head yet, but in audiology, there's a big question about what the relationship seems to be between hearing loss and cognitive decline or even dementia. So you might have already heard about some of this stuff. What does the research say? Let's just get straight into it. Um, I'm not going to background too much. This is, this is a quote from uh, Frank Lynn in 2011, when most of this intense research began, his study um, looked at about 630 participants. They found in their study that hearing loss seemed to be independently, independently associated with dementia. And they didn't know quite then whether or not hearing loss is a true marker for early stage dementia or if it's a modifiable risk, something that you could change and maybe have a preventative effect for the future. Since then, and you, you can't really see the bottom of this graph, but this is um, basically from in the last decade is where that, that axis is. It's showing that, that there, since his initial findings there that pointed the direction for the research, that there was this massive spike in, in interest. So this is the number of, of um, research papers published per year and 2022 is the highest peak here. It's only gone down because we're in the early stage of 2024 and they haven't updated the lists yet. So it's a massive amount of information that's being sought on this, this topic. More recent research. Hearing impairment may reflect the risk for cognitive decline and dementia as it's related to brain atrophy and tau accumulation in the brain. So this is from 2022. So this, let's jump ahead from 2011. Let's look at what we're doing now. Now they, they are finding these markers, these tau accumulation markers. These are markers that you use to determine if somebody might be showing signs of, of Alzheimer's disease. Those seem to be appearing in the brains of people with untreated hearing loss, okay, those, those markers. And we're seeing cognitive decline. We're seeing brain atrophy as well, OK? Another study, this is a much larger study of three quarters of a million people. So they didn't study three quarters of a million people themselves in this particular study. What they did is they, they cast a huge net and pulled in all of the data from multiple studies. It's something that we, you might have heard of before. It's called a meta-analysis. 
It's one of the best ways to see if there's a true effect. And what they found is that it was shown that, again, that hearing loss was independently associated with dementia, and that hearing loss may increase the risk of dementia in adult populations. You know, let that sink in. So it's, it's, they, they found kind of the markers for it in 2011. And now, this is uh, 2021, this particular group did this meta-analysis, and it's, it, it's starting to show that there is an association. One final uh, epidemi epidemiologic study um, of a meta-analysis of, of studies showed that it was associated, again, with cognitive decline in all domains um, with increased risk for cognitive decline and impairment and incident dementia. So that's just pulling people off the street with a hearing loss, testing them for dementia and finding it incidentally. <coughs> like we weren't looking for it, We've, we were looking for hearing loss. So it, there's an association there. And w when I initially um, was coming up with the idea to do this discussion and went back and forth with Sackba a little bit about, about what the topic could be, I really didn't have that much of an updated idea of how far along in the research we were. So this is now, this is now something that's very important for me and my work with my clients, because it's, it's making it a bit more important to discuss these things a bit more seriously than just it might be causing it. Um, so a couple of definitions. What is dementia? Well, dementia is differentiated from normal aging type things, we've all walked into, how many of us have walked into a room and forgotten why we went in there? <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I've done that plenty of times. I've lost my keys, I've got a little tile in my wallet so I can, that little thing, I can find it on a map if I, if my wife got me that, because yeah. Apparently these are all normal things that, that we experience. A dementia is described to, 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 is used to describe different uh, additional challenges to even mild cognitive decline. Um, many of you may have already gone to your physician and had or had your physician test you for certain elements of cognitive decline. That's, that's something that can be done very easily. Um, something that I just want to, to, uh, to talk about is the prevalence of dementia. It's projected to double every 20 years such that by 2050, over 100 million people, or nearly uh, one in 85 people, will be um, affected worldwide. Now, n next, the next discussion you're going to have in this setting with, with the next lecturer is actually uh, a neuroscientist from University of Lethbridge. So I really think you should follow up by coming to that one as well, because he will talk a bit more about the burden of dementia on individuals and on society. Um, the thing that I, I really want to put, put into perspective here is what normal aging looks like versus cognitive decline versus dementia, and then look at what hearing loss is doing to people as well. So normal aging, occasional forgetfulness, slight difficulty with attention, uh, mild cognitive decline. You might have difficulty finding or uh, important information that you easily remembered before. Uh, you might have trouble finding words. Um, or struggle with tasks that were previously easy. In addition to that, dementia gives you difficulty with basic daily activities that is beyond the normal range for somebody with just mild cognitive decline. You might have trouble carrying on a conversation. You might be seen as somebody that could occasionally have unusual behaviors, and that might be a sign that somebody, somebody notices. There can be personality changes with dementia, or balance problems and coordination difficulties. You might end up repeating a story multiple times to somebody that you've that you you know you, you don't remember that you told them, and <laughs> can be some some signs of of, um, of instability too. Now on the far right, these are the the symptoms of untreated hearing loss. Occasional forgetfulness. Well, why do you think that is? You, you can't you can't attend to things properly and remember them if you don't catch all of it in the first place. So that can look like cognitive decline when it might just be not receiving it. Hearing loss might give you difficulty with attention. Why why, why focus on things if they're kind of blurry, right? It's not truly inattention. It's just hard to focus on it because you're not hearing it well. Again, just like the first section, forgetting important information because you didn't hear it in the first place is very common um, in people without dementia with hearing loss. 
struggling with complex tasks, so things that involve communication can get increasingly difficult because if you don't, if you can't receive information, you, you're not going to be able to reciprocate your ideas. Um, other things would be carrying a conversation. Obviously, that's challenging. Is anybody here have hearing loss that they're aware of? Anybody? Any, yeah, some people will. You don't have to raise your hand, but you can think about it yourselves if you want. It will give you difficulty understanding other people and having a conversation that flows nicely sometimes. Is that fair? Um, you might be seen to have inappropriate responses in conversation. Maybe you laugh at the wrong part of a joke. Maybe it wasn't a joke at all. Um, we, if you don't hear properly, you lose the context and you might lose your place. It doesn't make it, it's not a grossly inappropriate behavior, but it might be seen as, what, why did they say that when I didn't mean that? And personality changes may, might be implied by the way that you act as a somebody without a hear, with a hearing problem. You might appear to be disengaged. You might appear to be uninterested, when in fact, you might very well want to be. It's just you can't be. There's some common psychological problems that you will find in dementia that also have a, a very close correlation with people that don't have dementia but have hearing problems like anxiety, social difficulties, depression, uh, those incorrect responses uh, to, to questions, uh, misunderstanding other people and maybe feeling a little worried or paranoid that you're not being understood. It's not typical to have hallucinations with hearing loss. Okay, that's not typical. It's not typical for it to lead to aggression, although people can become frustrated. Um, shame and embarrassment can happen. Personality changes can happen. Inadequacy, feelings of loss of self-esteem. All of those things are not symptoms exclusively of dementia. Those are just symptoms of hearing loss, but they have a correlation in dementia. It's almost like the hearing loss places you in a, in a position where you experience the same things. So this, oh no, I'm going to show you this slide, because I paid for this slide, by the way, everybody. $43 from ICEVA. This, um, this is from The Lancet. You might have heard of The Lancet. It's, uh, this is uh, from issue 380. So they publish every year one volume. So you know how long The Lancet has been uh, public publicizing their data from. And what this, this is is a, a really nice visualization of the percentage of reduction that you can create by changing something in your risk of getting dementia. And this is not made by people who sell hearing aids. This is made by doctors and research groups that are, that are neuroscientists, physicians. They might have some ear, nose, and throat specialists or, or people from the hearing care, care uh, sort of side of things involved. But I'm just going to take you through the risk reduction. So early life, if you have education, you, you're reducing your risk of, of dementia. 8% of your risk of dementia seems to be related to hearing loss. That's the biggest one on this chart, bigger than traumatic brain injury, alcohol, smoking, depression, isolation, ac inactivity, pollution, diabetes. They form those things that are discussed in that sort of color uh, channel that, like, that was coming up on the screen. Those are the things you can modify. Those are the things potential. Uh, now, I, I disagree. I don't know how you can modify a traumatic brain injury. Um, we're not going to walk around with helmets all the time, so we just never get, get that. But 40% of, of, of the risk of dementia, you can modify. The six, other 60%, we don't know yet what to modify to reduce it. We just, we just don't know. So what does that tell us? Let's go to the next stage. <clears throat> um, maybe the next stage. There's my money shot again. Um, hearing loss. It is the biggest modifiable factor it's not the only factor. And in fact, 60%, we don't know what we should modify to change things. But hearing loss is bigger than traumatic brain injury in terms of if we, if we treat it, there's an effect on, on dementia. There's, there's a limiting effect. Okay, this is, this is really the crux of what I want to tell you today. I'm not telling you just to fix hearing loss. I'm telling you to try and work on all of them. And you've had that message many times, I'm sure. Um, just about every other seminar will be saying, you know, get your exercise, don't smoke, limit your alcohol. 
But the one that maybe does get missed here, and the one that I'm responsible for as a clinician, is hearing loss. And, and it, it, it's a big deal, it's a big deal. 8% might not seem that big a deal, okay? But if you could increase your chances of winning the lottery by 8% by playing a particular set of numbers every week, I think you all would. I know I, know I would, right? The chances of winning the lottery are very, very low. If it was 8%, wow, okay, let's take that every time. And that's what I would say with hearing loss, is that, it, that it's, it's this sort of latent risk. So, so how is hearing loss involved in dementia? How does, it, how does it get us from not hearing to creating a, a measurable problem that's not related to the hearing loss specifically? It's, it's like a, a real medical diagnosis of dementia. So we really have to go back to how the brain, is de how the brain develops from when we, when we are, are developing the brain begins its development, and I don't know if this is going to show, maybe it won't. No, it won't. So this was a really nice slide. <laughs> um, this was bigger than it, w than it was, really. But what it was showing is that the brain starts off when we're very young as a very rounded, smooth kind of organ when we're, when we're, uh, when we're developing in, in, in the womb as a fetus. With stimulation, the brain grows. We know that. But the brain also develops density. It develops uh, complexity. And it develops the ability to process and understand the world around us. And it actually is what makes those experiences that feed into the brain cause it to develop into each of us to develop into who we are. We are able to acquire meaning from sound. We're able to acquire, uh, you know, the, the sounds start to just become meaningful in terms of language, and we start to associate them with objects. As, as, as young as, uh, as 12 months old, we will start to be able to speak. Um, we might have a vocabulary of 200 or more words by the time that we're three years old, and we can ask questions, and we can actually start to involve other areas of our brain. Now, we don't, we don't stop developing our brain until we're in our 20s, believe, believe that or not. It doesn't, doesn't speed up to the speed that it, the fastest processing for speech doesn't happen until we're in our 20s. So sound is just, it's just a vibration in the air, but it can have a great deal of meaning to us. Sound can trigger emotion. It can, it can make, us, uh, make us happy or sad. It can trigger memories. Musicians, their brains develop an actual map of the musical instrument that they play. We, we, can, we can see in the brains of people who, when they're listening to music who are musicians, that, that their brains play the, the instrument, so to speak, within their own brains. And this is, this is research from Nina Krauss, uh, amazing research into, into the development of the brain that just shows that, that it's plastic and pliable and, and it grows in response to stuff. Keep the question in mind, why does hearing loss develop, uh, in, why does hearing loss trigger these, this sort of uh, development towards dementia? There are some sounds that we find pleasurable. Who likes popping bubble, bubble wrap? If you, find, if you see it, if that comes in my office, I, it's a, we were trying to be a quiet office in audiology. We're trying to have people press buttons when they hear sounds, and at the front, somebody's ch -ch -ch -ch. So that's one of the things that, that uh, we acquire a kind of a mean, meaning for and fun, fun with. Um, I don't know if this video is going to play, but this is a video. I, I'm from Wales, and uh, me and Canute had a, a discussion about being around the ocean. But the, for me, the ocean is a trigger of, of certain memories because the sound just reminds me of growing up in Wales. Um, I asked my my uh, one of the admin staff what her favorite sound was, and she said the sound of a turbo. It turns out she used to work at the Mazda dealership. Um, so that's that. But look, that's the cochlea in the ear. That's the hearing organ in the ear. So. It's funny how nature sort of mimic, we were able to mi mimic things because they work in a similar way. So the, the cochlea is the organ that picks up the vibrations that get, get into the ear and turn it into signals. Now, we also acquire a healthy respect for certain sounds. Those that did not have that healthy respect for sounds are no longer with us in the gene pool, okay? 
And this little guy doesn't look quite right either, but it's a screaming marmot. So some things are, um, you know, scary, and some things are just as loud, but nowhere near as scary. Through our hearing, through the development of our hearing, we get relationships, we get, we get uh, careers, we get to talk to other people, we socialize. All of that stuff is the complex internal mathematics that our brains need daily in order to maintain themselves. So once we reach adulthood, we're, we're no longer a baby, we're growing up, we, we've had all these experiences, we've, we've listened to music, we've gotten scared of bears and marmots, and we are now at the stage where we're actually using our brain at its full capacity. Well, then it needs to maintain itself through those relationships. This is a, a slide for anybody from Britain. Um, there is a, th another thing about how the brain can grow. Have you, has anyone ever heard of the, the relationship between um, the brains of taxi drivers versus the brains of bus drivers? In, in, in the UK, taxi drivers acquire this thing they call the knowledge. And what that is, is it's the ability to drive the streets of London and know where you're going. I don't think they have it anymore because they've got like Uber, which tells you exactly where to go. But the brains of the bus, the, the, the hippocampus of a bus driver is smaller than that of a taxi driver because they, they've acquired the map of London okay, in their brain. So it's plastic and pliable, and that happens well into our 50s. Okay? So really, the brain is shaped by sound. And the message I want to tell you today is that it can very much be unshaped by sound, by a lack of sound. I'm not sure what that slide was. It was going to play something fun, so we're going to skip ahead. So the processes that go into um, maybe a, a visual of, of one, one of the processes that's been suggested as to why we initially start to have this slide towards cogn cognitive decline as a result of hearing loss is that in a conversation, our resources become overworked and we have to concentrate harder on hearing than we would on the actual conversation. And therefore, it deprives us, our brains, of certain uh, processes that we normally would have used to stay uh, in the conversation, we get reduced confidence, we are less likely to reattend that situation where we couldn't hear, and then we reduce our participation. Familiar story to anybody with a hearing problem? I, I hear about it every day. I hear about it every single day. People come to me and they go to other places too to get their hearing tested because they are, they, are, they are feeling socially isolated. They don't even necessarily know they have a hearing problem yet. We tell them right there, this is probably why. The other problem is, is that research has shown that we do have a very low awareness of the hearing problem, like I just alluded to. We, we don't know it's there. Um, we overestimate our abilities. We, we, we all do it. <laughs> we all do it, not just about hearing. But, but that leads us to social effects, too, when we're disappointed in our performance. And again, it mean, means that we're at increased risk of isolation. So isolating yourself because of hearing problems, well, maybe, I mean, it would be the same thing if you broke your leg and couldn't leave, leave your house and never spoke to somebody again. If you don't get to, to have conversations that are meaningful, then we can't reduce our risk. We can't reduce our risk. So how do we reduce our, our personal risk of dementia? Well, it goes beyond just hearing. It's not just about hearing. That's, that's important for you to know. Um, it's about social life, and it's about general health, and looking after yourself, and doing kind of what the doctors have been telling us for years that we sort of listen to, and sometimes it's kind of a bit tricky to listen to. But we've got to treat depression when we see it. We've got to manage weight. That's another thing that came up on there. If we can, if we can eat healthily, we can work on mobility. That's, places like the LSCO are, uh, are great for that. Um, other facilities in Lethbridge, we've got lots of opportunities to stay mobile. We've got to limit alcohol, okay? Doesn't mean you have to cut it out altogether, but follow, your, follow the healthcare guidance that we have on that. Um, manage hypertension. Get fresh air. Keep learning and socialize. Socialize, socialization is like mental arithmetic for your brain that is fun, hopefully. 
But that's hard to do if you've got a hearing problem. You can see the yellow ones. You can, this is all channel, channel, channeling through your hearing, okay? Isolation is a result of hearing loss. So what do people do? Let's prevent hearing loss at the root source if possible. So people may have worked in noise. It's difficult now to prevent what has happened. Um, but limit your exposure to loud sound if possible. Uh, get a hearing test. Be informed. Okay, understand the limitations of getting a hearing test. Uh, understand the limitations of what, what we're able to tell you in that. Go beyond just hearing aids. If you're being prescribed hearing aids, think of them as a tool. They are not the only solution. You've got to be part of that. You've got to, you've got to reduce background noise. You've got to get closer to people. You've got to know with your audiologist how to use those things. There's also other devices that are not usually a big expense. You've just got to extend your range with these things, okay? You've got to wear them daily. Your brain has to get used to hearing aids. Uh, I won't ask, but I know that there are probably several of us that have hearing aids sitting in a drawer somewhere, um, not being used, and that's, that's, that's sad for an audiologist, because I, I give people hearing aids, but I know that I'm preventing something if they can wear them. So if you can't wear your hearing aids, go back to your provider. You don't need to buy more. You might just need to work on the ones you have, okay? Let us help you. Um, so as I said, a significant amount of people don't wear the hearing aids. And why? Well, hearing aids give limited, uh, uh, hearing tests that we have sometimes are quite limited. The tests that are being done out there sometimes are quite limited. We need to understand how well you're going to hear with them before we can tell you how well you're going to hear with them. They need to be verified. As many as, uh, as, many as, as 70 percent of hearing aids are not fitted properly. I'm not saying that they're not as that, that that's as good as not wearing them, but what I'm saying is that they're not optimized, and and this is not this is not an anecdotal. This has been researched that there's a lot of hearing aids out there that need to be done better. Okay, so if you are struggling with yours, go to your provider, and and make sure that they're using best practices, because there's no point using using a hearing aid. People throw them throw them in the drawer if they don't help. Um, they don't always know what you want to hear in the environment. Those of you that wear hearing aids, how many times have you walked into a room and said, well, I can hear the people behind me, but not the people that I'm trying to listen to, and that's a frustration. That happens, right? Um, so there's some stigma. Some people don't feel comfortable being seen as somebody with a hearing problem, and that's an impediment. That's, that's going to prevent you from getting the help you might need to prevent that 8% risk of dementia. Um, he a massive number of hearing aids are currently just blocked up with, with stuff and no sounds coming out of them. These are expensive hearing aids that people have spent a lot of money and time getting, and they're just blocked up, okay? Check, check your filters, please. Um, and there is, a, there is a tendency to oversell and uh, give big expectations with hearing aids and inevitably not meet them all the time for everybody. So disappointment can happen. There's also problems with mismarketing this research, which is hearing loss causes dementia. No, not really. The, a tidal wave of cognitive decline. Well, 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 we'll let the next speaker talk about that next time and what the reality of that is. And hearing aids prevent dementia. Well, n no, not, not entirely. They, they might play a role. They reduce your risk, OK? And some might be more risk, uh, more risk than others. You might be overstating the problem then to say that hearing loss causes dementia. It, it's, it's part of, the, part of the, the things that we can modify. And we don't want to increase fear about this. I don't want anybody leaving here terrified uh, of, this, of this issue. We, we will work on the things we can work on. We will do the things we can do. And I'm part of that as one of the, the hearing care providers. My role is to, to help prevent the effects of hearing loss in any population, um, and, but hearing loss is just one of them. It just happens to be the biggest one we can modify. So the screaming marmot at the top of the mountain, what he was going to tell, tell us today, the, the message, the overall, uh, and that's, that's kind of a, a metaphor for me, um, the hearing care, the, the message that I want to share is hearing care is health care. We've got to control what we can control, OK? We can't fear the th some of the things that are out of our control, but if there are things that we can change, let's see if we can change them. We want to demand better standards in hearing care so that people 
get what they're paying for and get the benefit that they're looking for to reduce these risks uh, and to demand valid, valid methods when, when pr providing hearing care. So these are my references. Um, you can, I know you can all read them very clearly. <laughs> So, well, well done. Um, so thank you for your time, thank you for your attention. I hope you got something from that, um, and I believe there's a question and answer period. So as a unique opportunity, a weekly opportunity for people to discuss issues, SACPA is supported by many in our community. First of all, thank you to LSCO for providing this room free of charge, and we thank you for patronizing their lunch counter. Oops. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. We thank the Lethbridge Herald and other media for their coverage and support. And we thank Rogers TV for recording our sessions, which are available on TV and sacpa.ca archives and on YouTube. So if somebody, if you think somebody should listen to this, then they, in, a, in about a, a week or two, it'll be available on our website. So we have a question period coming up now. We ask those uh, waiting to ask questions, please line up along the wall here. Please state your name and your question briefly. No long preludes, please. And we expect uh, restful and polite discourse. If you prefer to write your question, uh, write it down and give it to me and I can ask it for you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Henning Mundel and thank you very much for your talk. Um, one thing I uh, struck me that you were talking, yes, to people like in this audience where the many of them may uh, develop hearing loss, but I want to ask whether we're dealing with the same paradigm or a different paradigm when people that are born without hearing or partial deaf, whether you would still have very much the same kind of associations for those as those of us that may develop hearing loss. That's a really awesome question and very thoughtful. So. Um, uh, there is some research, well, there's a, there's a big lack of research from the actual born deaf community, that's the capital D deaf community, those are the people that, that have a social group within themselves, they've never, they've never had hearing and they've never had anybody correct the hearing loss. So there's a, there is a lack of research into the incidence of dementia amongst those populations. But uh, we do, the research does, does, that has been done does seem to suggest that they are at some increased risk of cognitive, cognitive changes in as much as they are limited in that mode of communication. So the verbal mode of communication for a brain that has developed verbal communication is more affected by hearing loss than one that was never exposed to language in the first place, uh, or to audible language. So, um, also, so then if you, if you extend that to sort of the position that we, that, that, you know, as you mentioned, the audience might be in here being in that group that may develop some age-related hearing loss, you've all developed, most of you will have developed um, verbal communication. So that, so that channel will be the, ch the affected channel in you. If, if somebody who was born deaf uh, was to lose the ability to sign, um, then, uh, and they were socially limited, that would very likely, I would hypothesize, would have the same effect. It's, it's the social limitations created, not the, the physical impairment itself. Uh, my name is Graham Greenlee. Pardon, what did you say? <laughs> Quite a lot. <laughs> Uh, I think you mentioned that working around, around loud noises will uh, cause a hearing loss. And so I wonder if you could just confirm that. And if that is true, <clears throat> um, what actually happens in the ear the, to cause the hearing loss? Okay. So, um, yes. 
It does. It causes hearing loss. That's the short answer to it. Absolutely. Um, this has been studied for a very long time, but really became legislation was, was in introduced in the mid-1980s in workplaces to limit noise exposure to workers because it was becoming a, a, a big liability. What they found is that sound levels that are above 85 decibels for eight hours or more will cause permanent irreversible hearing loss. And that time halves every time the, the decibel level increases by five decibels. So 90 decibels is four hours, 95 is two, and so on. So damage can occur very, very, very quickly. Um, the sound of like a, a jackhammer is about 110 decibels, so we're talking just a matter of minutes before hearing loss uh, will be permanent with that. What happens in the ear is that there, the ear is a, is a partially mechanical device, so it, there's an eardrum that vibrates and passes vibrations through three tiny bones into a snail shell shaped organ like that, that one that we had on the, the screen here. I'll, maybe I'll go back to that if I can. But that organ, um, it, it's, it's a physical object. It can get shaken and can get destroyed by vibration. The tiny cells in the ear that detect those vibrations, actually the tips of them get sheared off by that vibration. Okay, we're gonna go back to that and just get past my mom at there. Yeah, so in, in this organ here, uh, this, this organ right here, this is where that, those vibrations end up, and that's where the damage from noise happens. Uh, the damage then can be transferred upstream, up the auditory nerve, because as that nerve becomes less active, you, you get degradation of the nerve, and that, that's somehow some, somewhat hard to recover. And also, you might get tinnitus, or ringing in the ears, where the absence of sound causes the, the brain to cause the nerve to become hyperactive, and you start to hear the ringing of the nerve itself. So that, those are very common associations with noise damage. My name is Maureen Hawkins. Um, before I ask my boring, pragmatic question, may I just add something? They're recently finding out that too much loud noise repetitively is causing brain damage as well. Um, a man who went crazy and started shooting people in, um, in the United States, he was uh, a trainer on grenades and things and they're finding now that they're having brain damage. So too much loud noise repeatedly can go even further. But my boring pragmatic question is, does Alberta Health cover hearing testing? And how does one decide where the best place is to have one's hearing tested, given that you mentioned yourself that you're, not all places will do it properly? So I should say, um all places will have the equipment to do it properly, and all, all places are mandated to do hearing tests properly. I think there, there are um, certain levels of training will allow you to do extra tests that might provide a, a deeper understanding of the type of hearing loss and might provide a more insight into how it could be treated and managed. So I think that's the advantage of going somewhere that has uh, a great deal of experience. Um, how do you know who to go to? Well, you can, you can ask around and see where people have gone, see where people have had success. Um, I, I'm not here to self-promote our clinic um, at all. Uh, you, you, there are, you can go through Alberta Health Services. There's usually a wait for that. Um, many, many hearing care providers will provide free hearing tests that aren't even necessary to be billed to Alberta Health Services. So, in many ways, if you need a hearing test, you can usually get one within the week somewhere. There's, some, there's no shortage of hearing care clinics in town, um, and so uh, of which we are an audiology clinic, so I suppose that's, that's a, 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 maybe a little differentiating factor there, but it, the biggest differentiating, differentiating factor really is um, there's, a, there's, a, there's sort of different people in, in different, different areas and different professions, and you, you, we're all very different people. Maybe find the person that speaks to your needs the best. Uh, but yeah, that's as far as I'll, I'll go on that question. 
Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm Wayne Tedder, and I've got, uh, I guess, a couple of questions. I think if I heard you right, no pun intended, that uh, maybe the hearing aids aren't adjusted for what you want to hear. Now that sort of implies that uh, the hearing aid may not be responsible to full spectrum sounds or maybe only the high frequencies versus the low or trying to hear properly in a crowded conversation. So maybe just educate me on what's available there. Okay. So um, first to answer the question is really, hearing aids are only as good as the ear that it, they are fitted to. So there are limitations when we come to amplifying a hearing loss with a hearing aid. We have to look at what the, the cells in the ear are capable of doing. Okay, so if I give, a, if I give somebody a hearing aid and they have only 50% word recognition, they are not gonna score very well with the hearing aid either. Okay, so we have to be realistic about what we're gonna get. Um, hearing aids are required, we are required when, uh, as part of our healthcare profession to provide verification that a hearing aid is meeting the needs of that individual's hearing loss. And that's done through uh, tests, uh, something called real ear measurement, where we'll actually put probes down into the ear to verify that the hearing aid is on target. And, and that's kind of where that, it's not done all the time in, in the hearing care industry. It's, it doesn't go along with, with more than, uh, it doesn't go along with more than 30% of hearing aid fittings, unfortunately. So uh, it's something that, that is, is a big part of, of um, being an evidence-based provider. And then looking at what that person's outcomes really are in the real world, so follow-up visits, checking in, telling the audiologist or the professional what you want to hear is important. We can't help you hear everything. You know, you don't expect that if you come to my clinic, don't expect that. But what we will help you here is we'll be very, what you should be getting from your provider is a very clear guidance on what you can do with a hearing aid versus what we can't do. Um, hearing aids are amazing, they're, they are, uh, there's no denying it. They're, they're really, really cool things for me to play with and, and really, really life-changing things for people um, when they're applied correctly. But, but yeah, there's, there's work to be done there. There's work to be done there for sure. Hi, my name is Kathy. And yeah, I'm asking like, okay, what do you do if hearing aids do not work for you? Because I've tried like five or six different types and can't seem to find one that I actually hear better without hearing aids mm -hmm. than I do with them. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, so, all right. So yeah, there are, there are uh, people that, that appear to show the signs that we should prescribe a hearing aid, but for whom they don't seem to work very well. And uh, what I would look at there is, are we providing audibility to that patient? Are we, are we actually addressing the needs? Have we verified that it's addressing the needs of that patient? What are the expectations? What are the needs? What's the type of hearing loss? Is it, is it fixable? Is there, uh, are, there, are there cells in the ear to, to, that can receive the signal? Um, I've got the cochlea up there still because one of the things that people will need if a hearing aid no longer becomes useful to them is a cochlear implant in some cases can be the next step after hearing aids. And what they'll actually do is uh, a, a surgeon will insert an electrode under anesthesia, please, you're not gonna do it as an outpatient procedure. Under anesthesia, they'll put an electrode down into the spiral-shaped portion of the cochlea and electrically stimulate the nerve directly. So that would be the next step. But almost, almost it's a very, very few people as adults will be candidates for cochlear implants. We're usually talking about children that are born congenitally deaf. They will usually be recipients and they will develop speech and language almost, uh, almost as well as, as normal hearing, ch hearing children where they previously would have been um, completely deaf, which is, uh, if you're looking for a miracle in all of this, I'd say that the development of the cochlear implant has been uh, been absolutely uh, amazing. So, anyway, that's my answer to that one. one more time. Hi, <clears throat> Bev Mendel Atherstone. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm the parent of a profoundly deaf adult child, so we've gone through the whole 
hearing aid process. She also tried a cochlear implant, uh, which did not work, and they don't always work. Brain is shaped by sound is partially correct, but sound is only one factor in shaping the brain. My PhD thesis research showed and was replicated that the brain can learn language not only by sound, but visually and somatically. Visual would be sign language. Somatic would be tactile, like Helen Keller, who died at age 70 with no dementia. Um, missing from the research that you quote is uh, people who lose, use sign language. Um, you mentioned that um, sound tends to, high, high density sound uh, causes deafness. As hearing aid use amplifies sound with cumulative stress on the cilia in the cochlea, um, then hearing aid use actually causes deafness. And we know that the children who had um, hearing aids as children who, um, who were partially deaf all became totally deaf as adults from the hearing aids. So wouldn't you be better off, rather than giving people hope that they'll, with the hearing aids, because the hearing aids will only last for a while until the cilia are all broken off by the increased decibels, wouldn't it be better off if you recommended to people that they learn sign language and had sign language in your audiology shops? Well, I will, uh, I, will, I will counter that uh, gracefully with you that um, there, ooh, did we lose something here? No. Um, from the research, uh, just currently in my, in my doctorate of audiology, we just covered pediatric audiology and we had a module specifically looking at um, pediatric amplification and the, the evidence presented in the audiological pediatric uh, pediatric audiology le lectures discuss this very topic of whether or not we're causing iatrogenic hearing loss, so we're unintentionally driving people towards further hearing loss. The, the current research shows that properly, properly verified hearing aids, and bear in mind, we've come a long way, so the, the, the research, research gets updated. Um, I'd be very happy to look at any recent research that you have showing that effect on children's hearing, that they become more deaf through the use of hearing aids that have been fitted correctly with the current knowledge that we have. I, I'm not saying that it has never happened, but it, it's certainly uh, something that is, would be considered incredibly rare and incredibly, um, incredibly big news to the audiology community if that was happening. Uh, it, verbal communication is, is the world we live in. And we, we, uh, evidence shows that children who are pre-lingually implanted with cochlear implants, for the most part it works, I'm sorry that it didn't in your daughter's case, um, develop n more normal social, uh, social behaviors and, so, and, and are more successful. They have a higher, higher rate of, of um, quality of life than those that, that were born uh, without hearing or that, d that didn't develop an integration into the hearing community. They may, may find the, their own community in the deaf community. But, um, and, and there is nothing wrong with learning to sign as well as, as, ha as trying to help, you help yourself here. There are multiple people that are, um, that are dual communication and that both hear partially and sign. Um, there isn't a, 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 an all or nothing approach to, to communication when it comes to correcting hearing loss. We, but the trouble is, is that I, I, it's very hard to convince somebody who is, who is prelingually deaf, as somebody who was born deaf and grew up in the deaf community, to actually come, it, to come to somebody like me is to erase part of their culture in a way, is to change who they are, what, what makes them who they are. So we don't see, see many people choosing to come to us for, for services. Um, but yeah, the, there, is, there isn't a great deal of, of evidence that shows that hearing aids will damage your hearing. Uh, actually, no evidence at all. And, and, if, they, and if it did, um, I suppose the, the whole industry that is built around that would, would not last very long if we were damaging hearing further. The fact is, for many, many people, we are, we are correcting for damage that's already done. The, the majority of hearing losses that are corrected by hearing aids 
already have lost the hair cells that would have been that, that could have been damaged by noise anyway and we're working on the inner hair cells rather than just the loss of outer hair cells if that might be a little bit more technical than we want to go into but but yeah typically the damage is already done and we're we're aiding that person to prevent cognitive decline your right uh, hearing loss is not the only only root of it and that was quite i think that was quite well covered there are many things that can cause it uh, but I do appreciate your question and your and your concern for those for those things. And if you do have the research showing that it it is damaging the hearing, uh, I would be happy to read it. We we do take take that information on board and and uh, analyze it properly. So thank you. Just a tiny little question about the hearing aids. <clears throat> is the amplification to 80 decibels and more? It can be, but many people's hearing uh, will have already experienced the damage that would have been caused by using a higher level of amplification, and we're looking at rehabilitating them through that. So there's no additional damage to be created in a compromised cochlea uh, by a hearing aid. So. Hi, Leona Jacobs. So I'm going to come back to the business about the loud noises, and one... Am I, the question I had had to do with loud noises, but is there a difference in the acceptable decibel ranges depending on whether it's an enclosed space or not enclosed space? What's the role of a silent space in hearing and hearing loss? And the other second question has to do with the role of lip reading as an augmentation to taking information in. So um, an, an individ individual sound space will need to have measurements taken in it to determine the exact decibel level. So even in this room, there'll be areas that are louder than others and, and you're at more risk in certain places than others, absolutely. Um, the role of the silent space in hearing, I, I suppose, uh, what I've learned in audiology is that there's no such thing as a truly silent space. Uh, we either have sound or we might have some of the noise within our own heads, the tinnitus um, that can be happening anyway. It's kind of a natural phenomena. Um, and absolutely, uh, lip reading, uh, speech reading, getting, gaining context from, from other people's uh, conversation, trying to, trying to go beyond even just lip reading, but, but asking follow-up questions rather than just asking people to repeat themselves. Uh, those are tactics that should be used, but absolutely, Take off your glasses if you can't hear, and it seems like you've lost your hearing as well, a further, okay? It, it, your visual input is massive um, in terms of improving your ability to communicate. Yeah. Throw, throw everything at it that you can. Gail McMartin, please discuss the efficiency and limitations of hearing aids for nerve deafness. We got. We're okay. So, um, so nerve deafness is maybe needs a little bit of definition. There's two. There's maybe true nerve def deafness, which is uh, what we would call a, a neurological form of hearing loss, and then many hearing losses are called nerve deafness, where they may just be cochlear deafness or, or loss of hearing within the the cells of the ear. Part of the reason for that differentiation is because the cells kind of have a little cup uh, that comes onto them. That's, the, that's the, 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 cell, the junction with the axon, with the actual nerve fiber. So sometimes there's some, some hearing losses that are to do with the junction between the two. It's, but we're, we don't really know, because we're not gonna take your ear apart and take a look and see what type it is. But, but we can definitely find evidence uh, that nerve um, deafness, like if you have Multiple sclerosis, for example, would cause a form of, of hearing loss that's related to the transmission of signals along the nerve. Um, that tends to be a more rare uh, occasion that we'll find this, but it tends to be, it tends to interfere with the ability to make sense of the sound, whether it's through a hearing aid or somebody just talking more loudly. It's less clear in an ear da with, with nerve damage than just cell damage in the cochlea. A co cochlear hearing loss is easier to deal with, and it's a less medically significant and a more common finding. 
Um, but yeah, no, true nerve deafness is usually you're going to go see an ear, nose, and throat specialist for that, uh, be evaluated for the reasons why that's happening, because there can be medical concerns there. But yeah, we typically find worse word recognition scores. We, we read words to people and they can't repeat them back as easily. Uh, there are various effects on the hearing test results because of nerve deaf deafness. But hear hearing aids still work for people. But again, adjustment of expectations for what we're going to get out of it is important and a careful approach to not over amplifying for things that aren't going to be fixable. Oh, okay, so for genetic hearing losses, genetic hearing losses tend to be uh, cochlear or they tend to be uh, mechanical. So the tiny bones in the ear or the eardrum doesn't form properly or it's all just full of bone. Um, so n there isn't really a, di a difference when it comes down to it in the way that we would try to treat it. At the same, it, the same token, that patient comes to me, they just want to hear better. So we're gonna just try and reduce as much background noise as we can and we're going to try and enhance the hearing aids so that they can focus on the, what the person's looking at. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there'd be a difference in the way we would approach the overall goal of helping that person socialize, but it's going to be a bit of a harder work for them. My name is Pat Greenlee. Um, when my father was about five years old, he got, he and his sister both had red measles and they both suffered quite severe hearing loss. Can you tell me what happens there when people have that kind of an issue? And this, like he was born in 1910, so it's, he was, you know, it was a long time ago, but. So, um, I'm going to plug vaccines a little bit here for a minute. Uh, vaccines have uh, really prevented measles from becoming such a, a cause of, of, uh, of sensory neural and conductive hearing loss in children. So um, it's, that's another uh, amazing thing that we've been able to achieve through progress, uh, particularly for the hearing loss, uh, hearing, hearing people with hearing loss, uh, we don't have those people in such great numbers anymore as a result of diseases that are preventable with vaccines. So um, what happens in, in the case of measles is that it could, it, could occur, it could create two different things. So measles can progress to become secondary meningitis. So it, it can introduce factors that will lead to greater infections of the brain or infection, encephalitis and um, inflammation of certain areas of the brain that might be involved in processing speech and language. It can also directly infect and target the cochlea and damage the, the delicate structures and the blood supply to the cochlea. There's lots of viruses that can do that. Uh, the other effect could be the, the middle ear itself, the, the, the air-filled spaces that are just behind your eardrums can fill up with fluid just like in any upper respiratory infection. And that can, can then lead to greater complications for the person's hearing loss that might be more akin to kind of childhood ear infections secondary to measles. And uh, retrospectively, it's really hard to know. We can just see the effects and I guess yeah, uh, that's really, really tough to, to hear. So, you know, somebody was born at a time where we couldn't do much about it. Uh, n now it's becoming less common, thankfully. So I guess I'm a, a common uh, male with uh, denial. So for years, my wife would be telling me, you need glasses, you need glasses. And I, I don't need glasses. So she tricked me. She sent my daughter with a paper to read. And I was reading, and she took a picture. She says, look at you, look at how you are looking at when you're trying to read. Well, then years later, she was also bugging me about hearing aids or, or hearing. You should take a hearing test. You should take a hearing test. Well, after a while, I said, okay, I'll take a hearing test. Well, I got a hearing aid, and I was quite amazed. I came back home, and I could hear the hissing of the gas on the stovetop, which I'd never heard before. I could hear the sparrows outside really nicely, clearly, not just, you know, the background noise. So anyway, I think hearing aids can be uh, amazing. And uh, so just a reminder, next week we're going to have Dr. Rob, uh, Rob Sutherland speaking again on dementia. Uh, how, to stem, how can we stem t uh, the tide of age-related dementia? But before we leave, do you have a take-home message for us? <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, I guess the take home message is that um, it's, it's kind of difficult to escape what hearing loss will be for with the reality of hearing loss for most people. It doesn't matter really that you get get it looked at, but where you get it looked at, or where you get where you get tested for your hearing. It doesn't matter um, who you go to at the end of the day. The, the issue really that I would say to take home is is get your hearing checked somewhere, rather than nowhere at all, and and just just get that as part of your 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 routine tests and checks that you do on your health, because it it go like many sort of starting health problems, it has other consequences that are quite modifiable. And I think the outlook for it is, is really quite good. So we take control of the things we can control. That's it. I guess the bottom line is listen to your spouse. <laughs> Thank you.